Can I can I uh, drop a couple of things in the chat for everybody? Will everybody be able to see it or not? Yes. Yes, they should be able to. I see. I see hosts and panelists. Is that is that one or is it another one or what? Uh, they're in the chat. You'll just change that to everyone. If you click that drop down, you should have the option to choose everyone. Uh, I don't see everyone. I see hosts and panelists. I see Zoom webinar at Swopecast.org hosts, and I see Darren McGee panelists. That's all I see. Interesting. Let's see. Are you one of the hosts? I'm just here to help. I mean, with I, I can send it to you. Maybe you can do it. Yeah, I can. I can we could do that. If you want to send it to hosts and panelists, I'll see it and then I can. Yeah, I'll do that. Okay. Casey, are we ready? Yeah, you're ready. Okay. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, we have with us Mickey Dean, who is uh, part of the uh, commission, who's been part of the commission on reparations in Kansas City. And this is a, in January, the Kansas City City Council approved a new commission uh, to looking into slavery reparations for black Americans. And this is a national discussion that we've had across the country. And so as part of our Black History Month series, we wanted to kick it off with someone who seems to be very involved and in working on those issues uh, across the country and across the city. And I wanna to welcome today, Mickey Dean to our Swope Health Lunch and Learn series for Black History Month. Thank you very much. Uh, well, Mr. Dean, I don't know if you wanna do an introduction first before we get started and just tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay, I can do that. Uh, first of all, thank you all for having me, uh, especially about this subject about reparations. It's a very important topic, and uh, we're doing everything we can to try to get the word out. Uh, as he said, my name is Mickey Dean. Uh, just real brief, uh, something about myself. I was born in Sandersville, Georgia. Anybody that knows me knows that I'll tell them that's the hometown of the Army Elijah Muhammad. Uh, I left Sandersville and uh, went to Atlanta to attend college. I went to Emory University. Uh, strangely enough, I ended up at KU out here. Uh, I was at KU during the height of the Black Power Movement, and, and most of us, well, a lot of us were, rather than going to school, we were going around the country chasing Black Power. Uh, and so ultimately, I didn't graduate from KU, but I moved to Kansas City and uh, finished my undergraduate degree at UMKC, and then I also uh, graduated from uh, UMKC Law School. Uh, I worked for a little while at Colgate Palmolive, and um, uh, and, I, and after I went to law school, I worked for uh, Basil North Law Firm. He's a black lawyer here in town. And after that, I went to work for the city. Uh, I spent most of my career at the city. I was, uh, first of all, the, the uh, head of the Civil Rights Division. We did all of the city's civil rights enforcement. And later, I became the uh, deputy director of the Human Relations Department, and then acting director, and then uh, deputy director again. And that's when I, I retired about 10 years ago. So that's that's my personal story. Well, uh, you, want, you want me to just get into some reparation stuff? No, go ahead. Okay, so I just want to talk about reparations, and, 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 and I know you gave me about ten minutes or so. So uh, it, it may be a little longer, but at any point that uh, that you need to cut me off, just cut me off, and, and uh, we'll we'll take some questions. Uh, but let me just say this about about uh, reparations. I'm a, I'm a founding member of the Kansas City chapter of the National Black United Front. Uh, and the national organization was founded in 1980 in Brooklyn, New York. One of our principles of unity, even at that time, was uh, to fight for reparations for Black people. And I can tell you that that over the years, uh, this has just not been a, an issue that has been uh, on the minds of a lot of Black people. As, I mean, as, as recently as eight or nine years ago, if you mentioned reparations to Black folks, uh, they would kind of give you the side eye. They say, yeah, you know, I know Black people deserve reparations, but it's something that'll never happen. And that was pretty much the, the attitude about reparations. One of the things that happened was that the, the Atlantic Magazine, and I encourage you to go find this article, uh, the Atlantic, the June 4, 2014 issue of the Atlantic Magazine, Ta-Nehisi Coates uh, wrote an article called The Case for Reparations. And uh, in, in the article, 
it, it, it got national prominence and it really generated a discussion about reparations. As a matter of fact, if you may remember, in uh, I think it was the 2020 presidential, the Democratic primary, uh, you had candidates that were talking about black reparations. So reparations had become part of the mainstream discussion. And of course, after the George Floyd thing, uh, it, it really uh, ex accelerated that. And so now reparations is, is part of the uh, national discussion. A couple of things about reparations. I know all of you have heard the story of 40 Acres in a Mule. And it's interesting that I find out that, that a lot of people think that that's a mythology, uh, but 40 Acres in a Mule was a real thing. And we'll briefly just tell you a story. Uh, when President Lincoln was, was going to sign the Emancipation Proclamation, he knew that there were 4 million enslaved Africans that were getting ready to be emancipated and didn't have anything. They had no, no home, no land, no money, nothing. And the question is, what are we going to do with these newly emancipated uh, formerly enslaved Africans? So he dispatched his general, William Sherman, who had just rummaged through Georgia and, and up the coast. Uh, he dispatched him to Savannah, Georgia to meet with a group of black ministers to put that question to those ministers. So he asked the ministers, uh, once you all are emancipated, what is it that you all want? Interestingly enough, they didn't say we want the right to vote. They didn't say we want fair housing laws. They didn't say we want an affirmative action. They say, give us some land and provisions to work that land for about 10 years and we'll be on our own. The second question he asked them was, well, do you want to live integrated? Uh, with the rest of the people, or do you want to be separated on your own as black people? They say, we want to be separated. We know what will happen uh, once we deal with them. So General Sherman issued what was called Field Order 15. And all of this, by the way, is online. You can read Field Order 15. Uh, the minutes were taken at that meeting with the ministers. You can you can do that too. Field Order 15 uh, confiscated 400,000 acres of land from uh, some of the former, former Confederate plantation owners. And this land was uh uh was was uh it went from around uh charleston south carolina down the coast to jacksonville florida 30 miles inland uh inland it was 400,000 acres and that land was given to black people and black people then began to move on that land they began a homestead they began to develop communities on that land but as you all know in history what happened was president lincoln was assassinated and when he was assassinated andrew johnson who was the vice president took over. Andrew Johnson was a, was a friend of the Confederates, and he returned all of that land back to Confederacy, rescinded Field Order 15, Black people got kicked off the land, and that's what happened with 40 acres in the mule. The mule, by the way, was that after the Civil War, the government had some leftover mules, and so they said you can have use of a government mule. Can you imagine, though, that, that if Black people had been able to retain that land, uh, what our situation would be in this country now, and be able to expand it? Uh, if, I don't know if you've ever been down the coast, but those places like Hilton Head, South Carolina, uh, in, in Georgia, uh, Saint, I mean, Jekyll Island, St. Simon's Island, that's some of the most valuable property in the country right now. Hilton Hills, as you know, is a private uh, country club, I mean, uh, golf course community. Uh, a lot of those communities are gated and, uh, uh, and they're extremely valuable. So one of the things we talk about the wealth gap, this is one of the first instances where the country at least tried to do right by black people, but that was, uh, that, that was eliminated. So we lost the 40 acres in a mule. And of course, after that, as you know, uh, due, due to the, um, uh, the, the compromise, uh, Jim Crow came in and black folks lost everything. Uh, one other person that I want to mention and a person you should look up uh, is Queen Mother Moore. Queen Mother Moore is considered the mother of the modern reparations movement. Uh, very interesting person. Queen Mother Moore, uh, she had a, an expansive uh, uh, activist career. She was part of Marcus Garvey's United Negro Improvement Organization back in uh, in the 1920s. And I saw Queen Mother Moore uh, at the Me and Man March in 1995. She was one of the speakers. So as you can see, her career spanned it a long time. She, she passed away shortly after that, but she's a very important person in the reparations movement. And I want to mention the, the organization uh, in COVID, the National Coalition for Black Reparations in America. And I was trying to put the uh, uh, the their uh, website in, in the chat. I don't know if, if, if it was successfully done or not, but, but you should really look up in COBRA and uh, you'll learn a lot about, about uh, reparations. Now, I mentioned the, the wealth gap, and I mentioned that because, because of Mr. all the Dean, things. Mr. Dean, I just want to ask real quick. We had a question in the chat. Can someone ask, could you share the date of the article from the Atlantic? They said they found it, but no date. June 2014. Ta-Nehisi Coates, the, uh, the case, for, case for reparations. Okay. Yeah, okay.
and you should be able to find it. Um, the wealth gap. One of the one of the enduring legacies of enslavement is is the is the tremendous wealth gap between black and white families. Let me just throw a couple of numbers at you real quickly. Uh, in 1860, the value of enslaved people in today's money was 22 trillion dollars. Uh, the, the enslaved Africans was the most was the most valuable commodity in the United States at that time. The value of uncompensated uncompensated la labor between uh, 1619 and in the time of emancipation, 1865, is estimated at $50 trillion. That's what they owe us, okay? And, and, and imagine what we would do if, if we were paid, had been paid for that, that particular labor. Uh, so that's part of creating the wealth gap. Another uh, piece of legislation that you should look up is called the Homestead Act of 1862. Basically, what was happening is that, as you know, as the settlers were moving westward, they were slaughtering and taking the, the land of the native people. The problem was is that it wasn't enough white people to continue to populate as they moved west. So they wanted to try as they moved west. So they wanted to try to um, encourage uh, Europeans to immigrate to the United States. In order to do that, Lincoln passed the Homestead Act. What the Homestead Act did was it would give 160 acres to any family that would agree to stay on that land for at least five years and develop a homestead. And, and, and throughout the history of the Homestead Act, there was about 246 million acres that were given to about 1.5 million people. The problem is that 99.7% of those homesteads went to white people, okay? If you read the act, it's neutral, it's racially neutral on its face, but black folks did not get a chance to take advantage of that. Another example of how the wealth gap be began to, 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 to increase between uh, blacks and whites. Another important piece of this wealth gap is the New Deal. You may have read about the New Deal in history. Two of the most important parts of the New Deal, one was uh, the GI Bill and two was Social Security. The GI Bill, as you know, was an opportunity for, for um, uh, veterans returning from World War II. There were, there were two parts of it. One was uh, uh, money for mortgages and two money to go to college. Well, as you know, uh, the, the, the mortgages, people were able to buy homes. And in most families, the homes is, is basically the foundation of wealth. Uh, for most families, but only 2%, 2% of black veterans were able to take advantage of uh, uh, the GI Bill. Uh, the other one is was uh, uh, the Social Security Act. Social Security Act uh, was basically designed, as we know it now, it's a reti more retirement, but at the time, not only was it retirement, but it was also designed to help people uh, if they in, 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 um, uh, in, in came to, into some difficulties in life. In order to get the Social Security Act passed, the Southern legislatures basically opposed it, right? Because they didn't want the people working on their plantations, the people, the black folks that they were working the cheap labor, they didn't want them to have any other resource other than working for them. So in order to get Social Security Act passed, uh, President Truman had to exclude two categories of workers. One was agricultural workers and two was domestics, okay? Agricultural workers and domestic made up 80% of the labor force in the South at that time. Okay, and black folks, and, 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 and that wasn't changed until the early 1950s. So here again, you got uh, white families able to develop homes. That's how suburb, suburbs began to develop. Uh, again, black people were denied that in addition to being redlined, okay? Uh, and then the Social Security Act. So this is why we have this, this wealth gap. It, it has nothing to do with black people not wanting to work. And uh, I remember being on a panel with, with this guy about reparation. He said, well, you know, if daddies would go to work, this wouldn't happen, and none of that. All right, this was deliberately done to deny black people the opportunity to create wealth. So now we have a wealth gap in this country of about 10 to 1. Okay. And studies have shown that if all we do are the regular types of programs, affirmative action, DEI, civil rights legislation, et cetera, it would take black people about 230 years to close the wealth gap. Okay. Most of us don't have 230 years. So the only way that wealth gap is going to be closed, there has to be some massive intervention and the only massive intervention that we see is reparations for black people uh let me just conclude by saying a couple of things today um you may have heard of hr 40 hr 40 is the legislation in congress that, that's designed to develop a commission uh for reparation now this this legislation was introduced by john conyers of detroit of michigan john conyers would introduce this this hr 40 every year at the beginning of a Congress since, I think, 1987, and it never got passed out of committee until 2021. In 2021, after the Democrat Democratic Party had reclaimed the House, 
uh, it was debated in the Judiciary Committee. We all around the country sat and watched that debate. Uh, as you know, in in the uh, in, in 435 members of Congress, you need 218 members to, to for legislation to pass the House. We had lobbied legislatures around the country, and we had the 218 votes for that legislation to pass in the House. It did finally pass out of the Judiciary Committee in April of 2021. We were elated because we knew if it was taken to, which means that it was right to take to the floor of the House. We knew if it went to the floor, we would win. What happened? The Democratic Party leadership, particularly Nancy Pelosi and James Clyburn, refused to bring it to the floor of the House. The reason was is that the mid midterm elections were coming up, and they were afraid that if, that if they introduced H.R. 40, that the controversy would hurt them in the, in the midterm elections. In other words, they were trying to win back some of the middle, middle white middle, white folks in the middle that Trump had won, and so they pushed our issue to the side. And as you know, they lost the House anyway, right? But that was pretty devastating. Now, we knew it, we knew it wasn't going to pass in the Senate because of that filibuster rule. you got to have 60 people. There's a, there's a companion bill in the Senate, but it only got about 20 supporters. Uh, so the, the tr strategy was, was to pass it in the House and then uh, use that as, as leverage to get President um, what's his name? Biden. Get President Biden to to establish the commission by executive order. He could he could establish this commission at any point by executive order. He has refused to do it. And there's a there's an effort now in the reparation movement called Earn the Black Vote, and it's basically saying that black folks need to need to demand certain things from President Biden if if he wants our vote. And one of these is to establish that reparations commission. Final thing I'll say is that. Uh, as was mentioned, we have a we have a mayor's commission on reparations here in Kansas City that was that was uh, seated, I believe it was back in May of 2023. Uh, the KC Reparations Coalition, uh, uh, and I hope that their their uh, uh, that our uh, uh, website is in the email. We were formed back in 1920, 1920 in 2020, and we basically worked to get the mayor to to, to appoint this commission. The commission is appointed. They've begun that work right now. We're trying to get. We're trying to get uh, funding for the commission, they, they, and their job is basically to study uh, what has happened to Black people historically uh, in this country, I mean, in Kansas City, and then uh, make some proposals for reparatory justice. And so that's where we are now. So in a nutshell, uh, that's what's going on in the reparations movement. Well, thank you. That's a lot of information that you've given to us today. And again, if you are interested in joining our conversation uh, with Mickey Dean, please throw your question in the chat and we'll get it asked uh, during this hour. Uh, but I have a couple questions for you. So you mentioned sort of the history of the rep reparations movement. How do we, in 2024, how do you track descendants if, if in a perfect world, if you're able to pass some form of reparations, how do you then track descendants uh, of slaves to get them their proper just due? Well, let me, let me mention that because right now, in the in the uh, reparations movement, there's a there's a real controversy about eligibility. Who should be eligible for reparations? Uh, there's there's one group, uh, and, and they go by the name of ADOS, uh, American Descendants of Slavery. Their their view is that only people who can trace their lineage back back to slavery should be eligible for reparations. Right. The other view is that is that the oppression of black people did not end with slavery. After slavery. We went through a hundred years of Jim Crow up until the Civil Rights Act, and then and then we still are oppressed. So that view says that everybody that has been oppressed by this system, right? Because slavery was only one part of it. Because remember, after slavery, you had convict uh, labor leasing, you had you had uh, sharecropping. In other words, just different forms of slavery that 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 black people, all black people who have been uh, uh, adversely affected over the years should be eligible. So that's that's just question, eligibility question. Now, the people who talk about eligibility, uh, part of what they're saying is that uh, is that the government should set up uh, those offices that do genealogy because not everybody, I mean, it's expensive to go back and try to trace your uh, history if you've never done it. And that in itself would deter a lot of people, but they're talking about uh, setting up uh, the government setting up offices where people can submit their information and, and have their genealogy done. But but that's a that's an issue that the commission in Kansas City is going to have to decide is who's going to be eligible for reparations. So to that end, so how do you actually measure harms? Like so like how do you measure the harms? 
that that's uh that that's that that's a difficult question how you quantify it uh there there are people who have who who actually quantified it now there are some people uh 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 william darity uh at duke university he's he's basically said that the uh uh the, the number is the wealth gap right that that black people should be given each black family should be given enough money to 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 eliminate the wealth gap. And I think his estimate was like close to $300,000 or something like that, okay? There have been studies that have basically tried to uh, uh, estimate the harm, whether, it, whether it's housing discrimination, whether it's employment discrimination, uh, it's not an easy task. Uh, but but there are people you know who, who do those kind of metrics and they're working on that. Uh, the commission, that's one of the roles that they would have if this national commission was established to, to, to do that type of uh, work to talk about trying to uh, calculate harm and enumerate the harm. But that, that's a question that still is still being worked on. So uh, what, I guess, in all, I mean, beyond just um, measuring the harms, what does the reparations actually look like? So does that mean like, is that free college? Is that an actual check? Is that land? Is, what, is it, what does the actual, uh, what does the, how do you solve if you, if you get reparations, what does that look like? Well, I would say all of the above, the things that you have. Now, now, when most people think about reparations, the first thing that comes to mind is a check, okay? And we think direct cash payments is an important part of reparations at the federal level. Most cities, like Kansas City, just uh, don't have the, the, the capability to do that, okay? But we think that the federal government does. The federal government can find money for anything that it wants to mind, find money for. It always can find money for war, and, and, and they're proving that. So we think that the federal government can do that provide direct payment. Other than that, there are things like uh, land. There are things like uh, free, free secondary education. There are things like uh, tax relief on, 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 from certain taxes. Uh, there are things like independent Black uh, healthcare institutions that, that have culturally competent uh, physicians and counselors. Independent Black schools where we can learn what we need to learn uh, for, our own, for our own liberation. So, uh, it could take a number of forms, and 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 and, and let me just say this about HR forty. HR forty started out as a as a study bill to study whether or not black folks uh, uh, deserve reparations. In twenty seventeen, it was amended to a remedy bill, basically saying we know that black people uh, deserve reparations. Now the question now is, what should the remedy look like? And that's one of the jobs of the commission to determine what should that remedy look like. And like I said. Uh, you know, we have to be creative with that, but it is more than just a check. Well, we've got a, cu a couple questions in the chat. Um, have there been any, have there, to your knowledge, have there been any cities that have successfully implemented reparations? The one city that, that was successful is Evanston, Illinois. As a matter of fact, uh, the, the sister who led that effort, uh, Robin Rusema, she's going to be in town. Saturday. So let me just make this quick pitch. There's going to be a Bob Black event over at the Bruce Watkins Center Saturday from 10 o'clock to 5 o'clock. And Robin Simmons, who who was a, who led that movement in Evanston, Illinois, uh, is going to be there. And the thing about Evanston is that they one advantage they had was at the time, Illinois had just passed uh, uh, cannabis sales. And, uh, uh, and, and I don't know if you're familiar with Evanston, Illinois, but it's really a suburb, a small suburb about 30 miles outside of Chicago. And the black population is only about 16%. But this is where it was first, uh, it was first passed. And, uh, and so they were able to use the, 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 the cannabis tax. And they started out with a housing program. They identified one of the main needs is housing. And, uh, and so what they did was they supplied all the eligible residents, residents with, with uh, and they're still in the process of doing this, $25,000, either for a down payment on a home or repairment. Uh, a lot of folks complain that it, what the money should be coming to them because if it, because you didn't never got the money. We just went to a, a real estate company or, or, or a repair company. So they changed it. So now you have the option of getting $25,000 in cash. They started out with an initial $10 million. They've had an, another initial, I mean, an, an additional $10 million added. But, but that's Evanston, Illinois, I think. At the time, at the last I heard, they had identified uh, about 200 and some eligible residents, but they're still they're still working on that. There are other cities like uh, Amsterdam, uh, not Amsterdam. Um, let me see. There, there's there's a, a city. Uh, there are a couple of cities, uh, and I don't have it in front of me. Let me just find this real quick. Um, 
Amherst, Amherst uh, in Massachusetts, oh, yeah. uh, uh, Asheville, South Carolina, Asheville, North Carolina. What those cities did was they voted a certain amount of money that they were going to deposit in a fund for repertory just for reparations. And then they, their commissions, their job was to determine uh, who gets what. Providence, Rhode Island is another. They, they, uh, I think Providence is about $10 million or something like that. Now, most of the cities are like Kansas City, where uh, we're trying to uh, uh, you know, do a study to determine the, the, the damage, exactly what the damage was, so we can have a good legal case and then go from there. You may have heard about San Francisco. San Francisco, they finished their study. They presented their legislation to the to the uh, the, the, the city council there. Uh, and, 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 and of course, what got everybody's attention, what they said, every eligible black person would get $5 million. That got everybody's attention. The state of California, they finished their study, and their study is now in the state legislature in California. In fact, uh, some of the black legislature just introduced a, 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 a bill that would that would actually enact about 10 of their recommendations. And they had, you know, 200 or so reparations in California. So that's that's the status of it. But in terms of paying reparations directly to black people, Everson, Illinois is the only city that has been able to do that at this point. And I would say to what you're talking about in California, I remember seeing a story about that where uh, one of the recommendations they did take was the California legislature passed legislation where land that was taken from African Americans in California has been returned to them. And some of it has been some of the most valuable land in California. Some of it was made state parks and things like that. And they returned it to um, to black families in California. And one of the ones that got the most attention was Bruce's Beach. Um, yeah. And that land was returned. I, I just want to shout out, there's an organization called Where Is My Land? And they got a website, Where Is My Land? They were, That was a group that helped the folks in Bruce Beach get their land back. But what, what, but, but Bruce, I mean, that's just one of, of thousands of examples of, of where Black folks have had land taken from them. Either from, from just, uh, and, and most of them are going after the land that was taken through eminent domain. In other words, government land taken by the government. There, there's, I mean, there's just all over the country, this was done to black people. And Where Is My Land is an organization that, that if you think that your family has had land illegally taken from them or wrongly taken from them, because some of this stuff was legal, it was just wrong, uh, you can contact Where Is My Land and, and give them your case. And, and it doesn't cost anything. They work on donations. Uh, they'll, they'll, uh, they'll try to, 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 to help you uh, uh, create a, a legal argument to get your land back. But that, that's happened all over the country. And, and um, uh, but yeah, I'll leave it at that. Uh, other question I had too was, you know, sort of following up from the previous question. Um, so talk a little bit about what is the task of the KC Reparations Committee and what is the timeline of your work? So so the coalition, as I said, uh, is, is made up of 13 people. Uh, they are working in what's called five injury areas. Those injury areas are where black people have been injured. That's, that's not the only places, but these are five key areas. Uh, uh, economics slash business, uh, health, education, criminal justice, and housing, okay? So what they are doing is, is, that, is that in each one of those five injury areas, they're going to do a deep study to determine exactly, well, first of all, the first uh, thing is to establish what is the, what is the state of Black Kansas City in each one of those areas, right? How are we being currently affected? The second step then is to do a deep historical dive to determine who was responsible, what entity entities and institutions were responsible for that, and then the third step is to come up with purport, with, with reparations. I'm, I'm sorry, with uh, proposals for reparatory justice. Now, because it's a city commission, they can only target the role that city government has played. Okay. Uh, but we're also at least going to do a study to show, you know, that the economic institutions, the health institutions, the education institutions that were responsible for the oppression of black people historically in Kansas City. Uh, and we think that even with those, you know, if you talk about something like uh, redlining, I mean, or education, the city, city government had a lot to do with the dividing line in terms of where blacks live and where whites live. OK, so so we think that there's there's some city culpability in all of those areas. There's some role that the city played because because we can only the, the commission can only hold the city accountable. But we want those other institutions to know what they've done. And we're also going to make demands on them for repertory justice. It's just that we have no authority to deal with those institutions. But that's the role of the uh, commission at, at the time that the uh, ordinance was passed. 
uh, they had one year from the date the ordinance was signed to come up with a preliminary uh, preliminary report, and then six months after that to finalize the report. So they have actually have 18 months. The problem has been that that this mayor uh, has, has just, well, I won't talk about the mayor, but anyway, uh, uh, we've not gotten the necessary funding for the commission to do its work. So now uh, that's on the table. Uh, we know that at least $210,000 is gonna be released to the commission. We think we need at least that much more in order to get this work done. But now we think we can get started on the work and we'll probably ask for an extension uh, of that 18 months to get the work done. So two things, and explain to the people listening what you're spending the money on for the work that you're trying to do. And yeah, so let's start there first. Most of this work is gonna be done, is, is going to be to hire consultants to do the research. Uh, one of the things that we've learned is, 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 is as I'm sure everybody knows, uh, uh, Race-based remedies are under attack right now, okay? Uh, you know, the Supreme Court wiped out affirmative action, but any race-based uh, uh, remedy is under attack. And, 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 and what people are saying is that reparations uh, is a race-based entity, right? Now, we say it's harms-based. It's just, it's just that, is that the harm was, was, was consciously uh, done to, to Black people. So we say it's harms-based, but at any rate, uh, th there has we expect legal challenges right so the research has to be very very carefully done um and and we also have to have a legal team to help us with that but research is very expensive i'm finding out in terms of hiring people to do that kind of research we're going to try to get some help from universities uh to do that but but most of this is going to be research done by independent consultants and then there's also some other things that, in terms of uh, you know, trying trying to, to to take this issue to the community, holding town hall meetings and those kind of things. But the bulk of that money will be will will go to uh, research. Okay. And once your work is completed, do you do you have an estimate or do you have an idea of what this could potentially cost the city from once they implement some sort of form of a reparation for the city? We do not. Uh, and 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 really. Uh, it's interesting when 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 the, when the people in uh, San Francisco was asked that question, uh, they said our task was to come up with proposals for reparatory justice. It's the city's task to figure out which one of those they can accept and where the money is going to come from. But but in terms of what it would cost, I mean, we, we're just too early in the process. Uh, once once the report is done, completed, it will be given over to the city legislative body, the council, and the mayor. Uh, here are the recommendations, and then it's going to be up to the city to determine. Uh, what it, it, what the city can do in, in terms of those uh, proposals. I'm not saying they're going to be able to deal with all of them. Another thing we understand is that cities have limited capacity. We, we, we're saying that reparations for Black people is a primary responsibility for our government. But if, if, you, if you look at a lot of the, the legislation that, that happens in the government, federal government, particularly on behalf of Black people, a lot of it starts at the local level. So, so what we're doing locally is not in competition to what the federal government would do uh, with their commission, it supplements that, and and we think it really helps spread that along. So we know that 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 cities do have limited capacity, uh, in spite of what you might have read in terms of what they're what they're asking for in San Francisco. I mean, we're, we're watching that. We'd be very surprised if 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 they come anywhere close to you know five million dollars per eligible family or eligible individual. But that's going to be up to the city to determine uh, what it can and can't do. Well, if you're still listening with us with uh, Mickey Dean, who's part of the Kansas City Reparations Coalition, if you have a question in the uh, listing, please put it in the chat. We'll get your question answered during this hour. You know, I'm reminded, you know, of even when you talk about, you're talking about forms of reparations. I know that the Jesuits um, had slaves as well. And that's one reason why there's an extra program at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C for folks who were descendants of slaves that worked at the university that helped build the university, they are now giving them free college tuition at Georgetown. Um, and I know there's several African-American families that have gone and gotten a free education through, um, through Georgetown because they are descendant of slaves. Um, my other question to follow And, and before, on, before you leave that, uh, let me say that there, 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 there's, there's been some uh, religious institutions that have done the same thing. Uh, the Virginia Theological Seminary, they set aside a 1.7 million fund uh, uh, fund to atone, to atone for its past involvement in enslaving 
uh, black people. Uh, and in the, you mentioned uh, the, the, the Jewish Jesuits. Uh, uh, um, Princeton Theological Seminary is another one. You may have heard about Harvard. Harvard now has set up a hundred million dollar fund, which is which is, you know, peanuts compared to their endowment. But they set up a hundred million dollar fund because they know that a lot of those institutions were either built with slave labor or insuring slaves. As a matter of fact, there's a group of students that did a study at William Jewell uh, uh, here in, here in the metro area. William Jewell himself owns owned, uh, enslaved Africans. All of, most of all of the founders of William Jewell owned enslaved Africans. And so these stu these students uh, did a study, and and I think you can you might I'm pretty sure you can find that report online, uh, as as well as some 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 uh, seminars that they did, and and I don't know what the latest on is whether they they're demanding some type of justice from uh, uh, William Jewell, but that's something in the works. There's some people uh, who are descendants of folks who uh, uh, who work for St. Louis University, uh, and they have a group that's demanding reparations. So. Uh, so, so the, the, you know, and, and then there's some people, there's some white families that have done studies of their own families and said, the wealth of our family, we realized it was created largely through slave labor. Okay. And so they are voluntarily trying to find some of the descendants uh, of, uh, of their family plantations to, to, you know, to do some repertory justice. So this is something that, that is taking place with religious institutions, with some educational institutions where people are saying, yeah, what we did was wrong. And uh, uh, which we're going to try to make amends for. Georgetown is one of them, even though I'm hearing that that they're going to put you through some hoops to to get that money from Georgetown. But the fact is, is that they did uh, they they did uh, delineate a certain amount of funds for what you said. Well, we got a question in chat. What can um, what can what can people do to support the KC Reparations Coalition? A couple of things. One is uh, I would, uh, I, would, I would go to the uh, the website. Uh, which I think is in the chat, and get on our uh, email list because, like I said, we sponsor events uh, uh, all the time. The next one, Saturday, uh, the 10th, at Bruce Watkins, we're doing a Buy Black, and uh, Robin Ruth Simmons, who's from uh, Evanston, she's going to be there. They, they created a documentary on Robin and uh, in her efforts, which, which dovetails with the national movement, and they're going to be showing that documentary. So it's a free event. So I'd like to see you all out uh, Saturday. Uh, the other thing is that we need more people to join our coalition. You know, there's there's still a lot of misinformation about reparations here in Kansas City. There's still a lot of education work that we have to do. The coalition has a PowerPoint presentation that that will go anywhere, present to anybody, uh, and, and we're trying to we're trying to reach the broad. Kansas City community, because even though we're talking about black reparations, we see that this is an issue that we want everybody to believe in, everybody to support. Uh, we know that right now, the the statistics show that only about 20% of white folks support black reparations, right? Uh, which is up from where it was, you know, three or four years ago. But we really need people to join with the coalition to help do the kind of work that we're doing, uh, to learn more about reparations and then be able to go out and spread the word on reparations. Uh, we always can use donations of funds because our work is, is is different than the commission's work. The commission is doing research. We're out here doing education. So we're trying to do uh, public relations types of stuff. So, you know, so we need money. We, we want to create some 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 uh, uh, audio visual material. Uh, we want to create pamphlets and those are the kind of things. So you can always help us financially, but all of that information should be on the, uh, I think it's uh, kcreparationscoalition.com on the website. And if you have any more questions, you can continue to put them in the chat. We're going to be wrapping up here soon. Um, so you've kind of kind of given us the outline for the history and where we are currently. Um, what else do we need to know about, you know, in terms of support of the commission's work? Well, I think that 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 as the commission, the commission, they're going to be doing listening sessions uh, throughout the community. They, they are divided into subcommittees and the subcommittees represent those five injuries. So there's going to be a listening session on education. So what issues do you have about uh, black people uh, in education? How have we been oppressed in education? The same with, with health care. I, I didn't grow up here, but I heard a lot of stories about hospital, general hospital number one, general hospital number two, the, the, uh, the fact that they weren't equivalent at all. I know about the segregated school system in Kansas City. Uh, we know about the fact that uh, uh, there are incidents like 71 Highway, 71 Highway, 
cut a swath right through the heart of the black community uh, and disrupted not only the homes there, but the businesses there. Uh, those are things that we think uh, are, are things that deserve repertory justice. So, uh, so I would say come out to those uh, listening sessions and then uh, once these proposals are made, then we gotta we gotta really work to 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 really get support uh, so that the city council can do the right thing, and 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 so that's why we're trying to go around and take the message, of, and that's why you know anytime anybody asks me to come talk about reparations, I'm willing to do it. But we have we really have to get out and take the message out uh, to Kansas City about reparations and why it's deserved, right? I mean I mean you know we try to talk about this wealth gap, you know. And, 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 you know, white folks say, well, you know, black folks just want something for nothing. White folks have gotten something for nothing since they've been in this country. I talked about the Homestead Act. I talked about uh, the advantages they got in Social Security. I talked about all of the discrimination laws that gave them advantages in, in education, in employment. I mean, they have had advantages uh, since they've been in this country. And one of the interesting things, uh, when, when they were debating affirmative action at Supreme Court, Chief Justice John Roberts said, well, you can't solve discrimination with discrimination. In other words, what they're saying is that, you know, you can't discriminate it against white people. Now, what has happened is that white people have gotten the advantage that they've gotten from discrimination all of these years, okay? Uh, that's why we have this wealth gap. And so now that black folks are saying, well, wait a minute, you know, what about us? They're saying, well, no, you can't discriminate. You can't, you can't face, face discrimination with discrimination. In other words, they understand that they're trying to lock us in at the bottom, okay? Lock us in at the bottom. Take take away all of the affirmative action laws, and of course, you know now they're trying to stop for you know teaching teaching you know accurate black history in schools. I mean, there, there's a, a tremendous backlash against black people that we got to be prepared for, and and uh, and so reparations is just one way, uh, and we think it's a key way because, like I said, given all this other stuff, and it's going to take you know over 200 years, uh, the, the 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 quickest way to fix this wealth gap is through some type of uh, repertory justice. I don't know if I answered your question or not. Try it. No, you certainly did. You gave us a lot of information. I really appreciate you joining us today and the employees and community folks who happen to join with us today for this Lunch and Learn. Um, I want to conclude by just thanking you for, for joining us and giving us information about reparations and how we can be helpful in the community. Any closing remarks that you might have, Mr. D? Well, I'll, I'll just say that, that uh, uh, I firmly believe that that black people will get reparations. We're seeing we're seeing cracks now. I mean, you, you know, we talked about Evanston. You mentioned the fact that that, that some of these uh, religious institutions are recognizing what they did and they're trying to make amends. Some of the universities are recognizing what they did. They're trying to make amends. Some of the white. So it's happening. Okay, uh, it's not. It has not happened on a massive scale. But the fact that 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 if you if you had told me ten years ago that the things that are happening now. Uh, would be happening, you know, I'd be hard pressed to believe that because because it just was not a topic of discussion uh, in this country, but it is now. And more and more people recognize the fact that black people have been deprived of the ability to create wealth and that and that we need reparations in order to do that. And so so we just got to keep the faith on this. Now. I mean, at one point, you know, people thought Matt Turner and them were crazy because they thought they could end slavery. They could get out of slavery, right? Uh, no, that slavery ain't gonna never end. So that's what they said about that. Black folks will never get the right to vote. Black folks. So, so we know what they say, but we know that we we can overcome, and if we if we fight, uh, we can get repertory justice in this country. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Dean. Thank you for joining us, and we appreciate you taking the time. Thank you all for inviting me. Thank you. Have a good day.